Welcome back to Old School Sports and our Out of the Park Baseball 25 series, Can We Save the Oakland A's? And after 10 complete seasons now in Oakland, we are about to begin the 2033 to 2034 offseason. Uh, just made a fourth playoff appearance in the past five years. Uh, the record for our A's is just below 500 at this point. Uh, Six of our first seven years uh, being below 500 did not help with that. Uh, but as I mentioned, for the last five, we have been in the playoffs and over 500, obviously, in each of those years. And hopefully, if things go well, uh, this upcoming season will finally get uh, the overall record during our tenure in Oakland back over 500, uh, which given that we've historically had the lowest budget in baseball pretty much throughout this entire series is a decent step in the right direction. As we get ready for this episode, uh, we're going to do things a little differently than we normally do. Uh, before we get started, though, uh, just thanks for everyone for the friendly welcomes back. Uh, sorry I was offline for a few days, but hopefully we'll get a more uh, consistent stream of episodes going here over the coming weeks. But for the last several seasons, uh, when the off-season has started, I've actually kind of moved forward a few days offline, uh, simply because it normally takes me several hours to do what I do over those first few days, which is replenishing our coaching staff at times, kind of beginning to scout out some players that we might look to pick up in trade, shopping a lot of players on our team to see what their value might be on the open market, and then spending a fair amount of time figuring out exactly what we're going to do in the development lab. And I've gotten feedback, um, you know, a few weeks ago to try to include more action in the episodes when possible. Um, and by action, you know, the viewers mean basically, I think, just more of talking through our decision making and the decision making process. So we're going to do a little bit of that in this episode. I'm not sure how deep we'll ultimately go. Uh, because again, I could easily turn this into a four-hour episode if I kind of walk through the normal stuff that I typically do in the first couple days of the off-season. And as loyal as our viewer base is, I don't think anyone should be subjected to three or four hours of my monotonous ramblings about a computer baseball game. But we'll try things a little differently in this uh, start of the off-season episode. Uh, if you find it helpful, good to hear. If you'd rather I go back to the other way, uh, good to hear that as well. But uh, we'll at least try to do things a little differently. We did at the end of the last episode uh, make an offer to Jackson Ferris, who is uh, one of our three big free agents to be this upcoming off-season. Uh, Ferris is the youngest of the three, and I believe probably the most important of the three to bring back. And I felt that way even before ownership uh, made it a goal to re-sign Jackson Ferris. Uh, why me 943 Stanley Rosella and Alkshi all pined on the last episode that they uh, were, were good with the decision we've made to try to bring Ferris back. So hopefully in the next uh, week or so of game time, we'll get some feedback from him as to whether the five-year, $110 million offer that we made to Mr. Ferris will be enough to keep him in Oakland uh, for another half a decade. Uh, with the budgetary constraints that we are going to be under, if we do sign Mr. Ferris, that will be the most significant move we make this offseason in all probability. Also got some feedback from Alkshi and YME943 that uh, those two members of our worldwide scouting department are generally okay if we decide to move on from uh, Justin LeBron and Maui Ahuna. Um, seems like the thoughts on Ahuna are a little more torn We've got a $7 million team option on Uhuna for next year, but right now my 
plan in theory is to potentially give uh, Andy to Rebio, a guy that we picked up in a trade with San Francisco uh, almost three years ago at this point, is a uh, relatively um, mid-range prospect who's become, I think, a good prospect. The first opportunity to potentially be our shortstop next year. Uh, the infield range is not perfect for a shortstop. Obviously, perfect would be 80 in this game, but um, I generally like to have a 7 handle, so 70, 75, or 80 for my infield range. At 65, he's just off that standard, but still think he can be a competent to above average defensive shortstop with these ratings and with a bat that is uh, interesting compared to what Maui Ahuna brings to the table and the fact that Toribio will be making the major league minimum next year and he's durable and he's about five, six years younger than Toribio, uh, than Ahuna, um, makes me think that might be the way to go because Ahuna as good as he is defensively, um, is fragile physically, 31 years old, and has uh, proven decisively at this point that he is a well below average major league hitter. Uh, but he is an incredibly consistent major league hitter. Every season he's been in the majors, which at this point is now eight years, uh, he has had a WRC plus between 68 and 79. So he is very consistent in his mediocrity slash below average performance with the bat. But given that he is set to make uh, $7 million this upcoming year, I'm leaning towards moving on from Mr. Ahuna. And before we finish up talking about Mr. Ahuna, one of the things that I typically do at this time of year is start shopping the players on my team who either have team options that we might not pick up, have arbitration numbers that are getting high in my view, and or uh, are finally out of options and are going to need to be on the 26-man roster next year to avoid risking losing them through waivers. So Ahuna is a good guy to um, start with. Is uh, I guess this will be episode will be uh, a little bit of the sausage making uh, that I normally kind of do offline, and I think there's actually going to be pretty decent um, demand for Mr. Ahuna. Uh, I shop him around. I'll just do a uh, full view of everything, prospects, regulars, and veterans that we can potentially get for Ahuna with that $7 million option. And you can see he's got some decent value on the trade market. Uh, there's a ton of different players that we can get back for him straight up. I don't know that we're necessarily going to do any of these deals. Um, because I'll be doing some player searches also for guys that I think might fit what we need better. But it's good to know that if we do decide that we're going to decline that option and not bring Ahuna back, uh, we can probably trade him to a team that will presumably exercise that option. Uh, a couple of the higher-end guys, Chris Laughlin, a catcher, Switch hitting catcher who uh, looks actually a little bit better against left-handed pitching than right-handed pitching. Pretty competent defensively. Um, has spent parts of the last, actually spent all of this past season and then a brief uh, part of 2032 in the majors with the Cubs. Uh, has put up a 95 WRC plus in an admittedly small sample size, but... Uh, Looks like he's a competent offensive catcher who's a solid defensive catcher, albeit with a below average arm. But if we can't find another trade and I decide that I'm going to move on from Mr. Ahuna, would I consider trading him straight up for Laughlin? I think I certainly would if I'm just going to move on from him anyways. Uh, Dylan Teferi, uh, left-handed hitting outfielder 
like the personality, don't love the defense, uh, but we are potentially looking for a left-handed bat, although I know as some of you have said, uh, we don't necessarily need to do that, but Teferi could be a useful and cheap bat for us against uh, right-handed pitching in particular, um, only set to make a little over a million and a half in arbitration this coming year. So there is some value uh, with Mr. Ahuna. We'll actually do another uh, couple shoppings while we're doing it again. Uh, I hope this is interesting to some of you. This is all typically stuff that I just do offline in these opening moments of the offseason to get an idea of where our players have value and uh, where they don't have value of some of the guys that I might be moving on from. Justin LeBron is another guy that um, we might move on from, set to make around $4.5 million in arbitration this year. Love his defensive versatility as an infielder. Love the personality overall, especially the captain personality class. But I have to be realistic about what he has been with us over three and a half seasons in Oakland. And he's a 231 career hitter with us in Oakland, 221 with the Yankees, 226 over the course of his career, a mid 80s WRC plus for a guy who plays 60 games a year, a couple hundred at bats, primarily against left handed pitchers. Four and a half million for that guy seems a lot to me. I don't think LeBron is going to have the same kind of trade value as uh, Maui Ahuna does, although you can see some of the same guys, Dylan Teferi and Alan Wallace, and I'm guessing a couple of these other guys that I didn't pay as much attention to we could get for him. And there is still um, a decent opportunity set of some uh, likely a bit above replacement level guys that we could get in return for him. Uh, so plan on spending some time digging through those kind of options with Mr. LeBron. And the last guy that I'll shop right now is kind of talking through our thought process is Henry Lalane, um, who's a pitcher that I really like, a left-hander who can start or relief, uh, start or relieve, if I could uh, speak properly. He's now uh, been with us the last couple years in the majors in Oakland and overall done a pretty nice job with a 366 ERA, struck out 173 batters in uh, 172 and a thirds innings pitched for us. Uh, basically a war of around one each of his seasons with us. Uh, a good solid arm out of the bullpen who could start for us if we needed him to. But set to make about $6 million in arbitration this coming offseason. If we're really going to use him only as a left-handed middle reliever, uh, that dollar price starts getting a bit expensive. And uh, you can see there are some guys we can get back for Lelaine in trade. Not really anyone who meets the needs that we are looking for. And the list is a little bit shorter than some of those other guys. But uh, there is trade value in all three of these players. Again, I don't know that I'll end up using them for the players who have been offered to me. Probably going to try to more package some of them together with perhaps some higher end prospects to bring back a guy who I think could be a potential true impact player for us and really fill a potential hole on our team but uh, this is one of the things that I'm typically doing offline in the early days of um, the off season. again just to ensure that if there's guys who aren't going to be back with us next year or aren't going to likely make our 26-man roster we extract whatever value we can in the trade market for them in the early days of the off season. And I'll also glance at uh, the trade block this time of year, but uh, as you can see, there are not necessarily a ton of uh, interesting players available on the trade block, particularly right when the offseason gets underway in OOTP. So although I'll glance at that, uh, what I typically want to do is uh, do some player searches and 
one of the things that we're potentially looking for this off season is a catcher who can uh, give us some good defense with some respectable-ish offense. And you can see there's actually a fair amount of catchers out there with 60-plus defense who are at least major league average in a number of the offensive categories that uh, we can search for on this screen. Unfortunately, the prices for uh, some of the most interesting guys are uh, prohibitive for us. Uh, I did look at some of this stuff uh, between the last episode and this one, even though I haven't actually moved forward at all. Uh, Danny McDaniel, for instance, a 26-year-old who's excellent defensively uh, with a pretty interesting bat for a catcher. He's only gotten a cup of coffee with them over the last few years. Um, so you would think that uh, perhaps the Dodgers wouldn't uh, have huge value on the switch hitting catcher. But uh, unfortunately, when we try to trade for him straight up, uh, even though he's struggled to get playing time with the Dodgers and he's now 26 years old, uh, we don't have anyone in the organization that makes this deal work. And even if we were to throw in our top prospect, Arturo Uresti, which I don't know uh, that I would actually do, there's not even another player with Uresti that makes that deal work. Uh, and unfortunately, we've seen something similar with some of the younger and better catchers who are available. But one that I'm kind of keeping my eye on as a fallback option is Joe Mack of the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, this is a guy who will be headed to free agency uh, shortly. And he is a competent defensive catcher with a bat that looks like almost the perfect definition of league average. Um, he's only put up a 73 WRC plus over the course of his career. Uh, but as a left-handed hitter, he profiles a little bit better against right-handed pitching than left-handed pitching. And he's also going to be headed to free agency relatively soon, uh, unless the Orioles decide that they uh, want to lock him up before then, which given his age, um, I'm not expecting is going to be something that they will do. But you can see Mac only going to be looking for two and a half, three million a year. And he is, again, competent-ish offensively, a little bit above average defensively. Probably not the perfect answer for us at catcher, uh, but if we don't want to end up making a bigger trade for somebody, certainly somebody that we could think about. But uh, a lot of these guys are young and very expensive. Uh, young and very expensive in terms of the trade assets we'd have to get up for them, and then several of these guys are older and extremely expensive in terms of the salary that we would need to bring on to our books. Uh, and in some cases, we'd also need to be giving up some pretty significant resources for them as well. So there's not necessarily, in my mind, any obvious trade here. Mike Stafford with St. Louis um, is another guy that I like a little bit. Pretty good defensive catcher, although not a great arm. Again, just a competent bat, but he is a left-handed hitter whose splits work a little better against right-handed pitching. Fragile physically, still making the major league minimum, could be a potential member of a mediocre platoon for us with Jaden Boakai, uh, the rookie from last year. But when you look at the price tag for a guy like Mike Stafford, um, basically looking for some of the better young players in our organization to bring him on board. And uh, I don't know that, you know, I think Sam Bailey is the guy of these three that I value the least, but particularly if we end up moving on from Henry Lillane, Bailey is a very similar profile, a left-handed arm who could start or relieve for us, good influence in the clubhouse, did well when he finally made his major league debut this year and he's going to be making the major league minimum for another couple of seasons. Um, so I don't know that I trade him away for a guy who is a fragile, mediocre hitting catcher with good defense. Um, 
So those are some of the kind of things that I look about as far as the player searches. Uh, another one that I did do um, offline was look a little more heavily for the left-handed bat that I think um, we may want to bring on our team. And unfortunately, when we look for a left-handed hitter who's above average in contact, power, and eye, uh, that brings us to some of the top players in baseball, of course, who are making big money, and then also some of the top prospects in baseball. Juan Molina from the Texas Rangers would be an incredible bat personality and uh, glove to add into our organization. Not only does he have the captain personality, he's got the perfect personality with a positive on all six of the aspects that the game uses. And all he did as a rookie this year was hit 290 with 39 homers and 120 ribbies. Would think that he's going to have a very strong case to be the AL Rookie of the Year. But uh, clearly the price tag for Mr. Juan Molina is uh, going to be incredible. And even if we give up Uresti and Matt Perry and Luis Coronado and Omari Raphael, you know, four of the top prospects in our organization, doesn't even scratch the surface on what Texas would want for him in a trade. And uh, I've seen something similar with some of these other guys. Grady Emerson from the Houston Astros is another young player who's incredibly intriguing to me. A left-handed hitting infielder with a solid bat, solid speed, and a solid glove. Hit 280 with 15 homers and 454 at bats for Houston uh, as a rookie. This actually, he was a rookie last year, uh, but his first fullish season in the majors this year, even though it looks like he still spent over a month in AAA this year. Um, given that he's going to be 26 years old before the season starts, you might think, eh, he was a first round draft pick, but Houston doesn't necessarily seem completely committed to him. But the uh, trade values for him are uh, just as crazy, unfortunately. You know, we start adding in the top four prospects in our organization, or more accurately, four of the top prospects in our organization, and we can't even uh, sniff him. So uh, Zach Hickok of the White Sox organization, similar. And then a lot of these other guys are just making insane money, so... We're likely not going to be able to execute on a trade for a true impact left-handed bat, unfortunately. Uh, which brings us back to our old friend, Mr. Bonello, Elliot Pizza Bonello, who we looked at last offseason and thought about bringing on board. He had a more than competent uh, rookie or yeah, rookie season for him uh, since he only hit 63 at-bats the year before in Cleveland. Uh I don't think he's a great player, but I think he's a guy we could potentially extract more value out of, uh, like his defense, really like the personality, and although the bat isn't exciting to me and he's fragile physically, although he only has a 98 WRC plus over the course of his major league career, He's been well below average against left-handed pitching, and he's actually been above average against right-handed pitching and well above average in the full season this year. So I think that uh, if we were going to use him in a situation as a platoon, perhaps, uh, with a guy like Tavares, who's a right-handed hitting outfielder who would be playing only against left-handed pitching, there is still some part of me that wants to bring on Benello. And although um, his price is not as high as, or not as low as it was when we first started looking at him about a year ago, it's also not as high as it was um, a month or two after we started looking at him. Um, you can see right now we have to give up some of the key players on our team or some of the top prospects in our organization to bring him on board. But I think that there is a potential deal for Elliot Bonello, um, not necessarily using one of these really top prospects, but uh, potentially a combination of um, 
some of the guys that we just talked about that we may need to move on from, like Lelaine, LeBron, Ahuna, with a more middling type of prospect or two, and we might be able to get a deal for Elliot Bonello done, which I think would be uh, a step in the right direction for this team. And I also obviously get the development lab started on this first day of the off season every year. Uh, this is something that I typically talk to, uh, so this may be a little less novel than than some of the previous stuff that is uh, typically going on behind the scenes. But we've got eight guys in the lab this year: Jaheim Pennyman and Josh Mangano. A couple of young pitchers going to be working on their control. And Omari Raphael, another young pitcher, going to be working on increasing his pitch movement. We've got some of our hitting prospects, uh, potentially working on some more complicated programs. Berchand Albrighton and Alejandro Landin, a couple of the top prospects in our organization, working on their home run power by trying to generate more bat speed, even though those... Uh, Programs are typically hard, and Arturo Uresti working on quality of contact. Uh, we've also got a couple other programs. We're going to put Toribio to start on a short program for the next four to five weeks to improve his defense at shortstop. We're going to clearly need to make a decision on Ahuna before we'll know the results of this, but if we get lucky and Toribio somehow improve some of his defensive ratings to make himself an even more proficient defensive shortstop than we think he is. Uh, again, with that bat, that speed, that durability, and a good personality, I think uh, he could man the position well for us for the next few seasons, even though he's not necessarily as dynamic defensively as Rincon and Ahuna have been over the past half decade or so for us at the position. And then um, the last one is a suggestion from Alkshi that um, I actually um, did uh, make a change for. I had Jake Ortega originally um, trying to work on that last bit of contact improvement, um, try to make him a more valuable player. Alkshi, who always has uh, interesting advice, um, suggested that given his fragility, a strength and conditioning program could be the way to make Ortega an even more valuable player than he already is. And he's had wars of over five in each of his first two seasons, so he's a pretty darn valuable player already. But I do agree that uh, doing what we can to ensure that Ortega stays in the lineup as much as possible probably makes sense. So these are the programs that I'm leaning towards um, starting off this offseason with. The one that I think would be most likely to change um, would potentially be Bertrand Albrighton. And he's a guy who, if you were looking closely, um, we could use in a trade straight up for Benello. And that's something that I am considering Al Bright in the international free agent we signed in 2026 has been one of the top prospects in our organization over the years. Uh, he hasn't developed as rapidly as I would have hoped. He's already 24 years old. He's always been fragile physically. But he did a pretty good job in 184 AAA at-bats last year for us. Has a great personality and still think that there's some potential with that bat, particularly if we're able to um, unleash that untapped home run power potential that our scout still thinks is there. So I'm seriously considering investing in this Generate Bat Speed program from Bertrand Albrighton, but the reason I say that uh, it may not happen for him is that Al Brighton is one of those guys who's now um, through his option years. So we're going to have to put him through waivers this coming spring if he doesn't make the 26-man roster. 
And if I think he's not going to make the 26-man roster, there is a part of me that would just rather trade him away right now, get him out of the development lab, and if we were able to do that, uh, that would open up a spot that uh, I went back and forth with how to use the last final spot that we have in the lab this year. But uh, we did talk about this after the draft this past season that uh, Doug Weiss, who we picked out of Austin P in the fourth round, is a guy who uh, looks like he could be helping us in the bullpen at the major league level in relatively short order. And with the stamina that he has, he is a guy who we could at some point try to put in a development lab um, to get that very difficult adding a new pitch. And if Weiss was able to add a new pitch, he potentially becomes a guy who could be a pretty darn useful major league starter instead of a pretty darn useful major league reliever. So if I decide we're going to move on from Al Brighton is one of the trades that I'll be thinking about in the coming uh, day or so offline. And we do trade Mr. Bertrand Al Brighton away. It's possible that we'll work on getting Weiss into the development lab right now. Um, if not, I would think he'll certainly have a spot in it next year. I guess I could argue um, Toribio improving his defense at shortstop is one that we don't necessarily have to do right now because there will be time to do that in the uh, shorter period at the beginning of the offseason after these remaining programs get done. And as I said, the decision-making around Toribio, um, even four or five weeks from now, Ahun is either going to be with us or he's going to be gone before we know the results of um, the defensive ratings, um, potential improvement on Toribio. So I would say that uh, the one thing I'm still considering as far as the development lab is if we trade Al Brighton, that would open up a spot for Weiss. If we decide to keep Al Brighton, I still might pull Toribio out of this program um, today before we move on and put Weiss into a program to see if we can uh, start supercharging his development a bit with the thought that we'll just put Toribio into the defensive shortstop program come uh, late January, early February, whenever this uh First batch will be done. I guess it's more probably mid to late February if I could do some simple math. And we've talked a lot about uh, suggestions from Alkshi in this episode. And Alkshi has, over the past uh, several seasons, started to uh, very graciously and generously uh, deliver his detailed analysis of uh, what he would do with our roster in the off season after we do our annual roster review. And one final thing that uh, Alkshi mentioned that I thought was interesting uh, was how to use Levi Sterling next year. And with the almost certain departure of Burns, um, we've definitely been thinking that we're going to have at least one spot in our rotation next year. And I had been generally considering pivoting Levi Sterling into that role, but Alkshi did mention uh, potentially considering using Levi Sterling in the stopper role, and that is something that those of you who have followed me for years know that um, I've used pretty aggressively in some past series. I haven't really felt um, that we've had a player worthy of that role, generally with Oakland over the first decade of this series, unfortunately. But I do think that's um, good advice and something I am going to consider over the course of this offseason. Uh, because Sterling um, has really good stamina. And we could potentially turn him into a 130, 140 kind of inning guy in a stopper role. In which case he would probably be pitching some higher leverage innings than even if he pitched a 130. 60 innings as a starter for us. 
simply because uh, some of those innings that he's pitching as a starter are uh, going to not be all that important because we've already taken a five-run lead or uh, we've already fallen behind by five runs, although in those situations he's probably still not in the game. But um, it is something that I'm at least thinking about um, in terms of trying to maximize the uh, – innings that our best pitchers give us and uh I do like losing using that stopper role I think it can be an important asset in the game have talked a lot about it particularly I think in OOTP 24 when we were doing our uh, Buffalo Wings series there and it's something that I will definitely give some consideration to as this offseason moves forward uh, because we do even if we move on from Henry Lalane with guys like Kate and Dana Sam Bailey Ted Johnston and even Jaheim Pennyman lurking in our organization we do have several guys who we could slide into a fifth starter role for next year if we kept uh, Sterling in the bullpen working as our stopper eventually so some interesting things to consider there as well and another thing that i mentioned that i typically do offline is kind of fill the roles on our coaching staff but uh paul west uh brought up hey that would be something different to uh kind of walk through your thought process and share some thoughts about i have done I think multiple videos in the past that are in the tutorial and strategy section of our channel uh, as far as how to build a coaching staff, but it's not something that I typically talk through all that often as I'm running through the actual gameplay of series. So I thought that was a uh, good thing to potentially spend a little time on before we finish up this uh, rather random episode that's just uh talking through our thought process um for the off season in a little more detail than i typically do and we did let brian conger who's been our pitching coach since the start of this play through um move on this off season uh part of the reason is that we've got a lot of really good coaches uh throughout our organization and many of these coaches have been asking us for promotions and uh want to keep some of these younger guys in our organization uh pitching coach dave bush for instance has been with us for 10 years in triple a he's excellent at teaching pitching good with development good with mechanics and uh, we expect that he's going to have a good relationship with Oakland A's players. Um, So really the only question about uh, Bush is whether his personality would work well with the staff that we have at the major league level. He's personable, works well with temperamental guys, uh, but he struggles with easygoing guys. And when we take a look at this... um, We don't have any of the temperamental guys that he works well with on our staff, but fortunately we also don't have any of the easygoing guys that he struggles with, and his personable personality will actually uh, work out well with our first base coach, Jacob Doris. So I'm still going to do a search just to see if there is some incredible pitching coach on the open market who might fit even better for us but given that i do want to keep uh, as many of these guys together as possible um, since i like our pitching coaches um, across our organization i think i'm inclined to promote dave bush to the major leagues and then that would let us take a look at josh conway uh, another guy who's been with us for a full decade and at the double a level excellent at teaching pitching good with development in mechanics and another guy who we expect to have good relationships with the players you know these are the kind of coaches that uh, we've built our organization around uh but both bush and conway are significantly younger than conger so we let conger move on this past off season with the thought that we would most likely promote Bush to the majors, promote Conway to AAA, make them both happy, 
and then kind of fill in some of the gaps in the lower levels of our organization. And uh, we do also have some guys in the lower levels of the organization that are looking for promotions as well. Um, Ryan Seidel, I thought was one of them, but I must uh, be mistaken. But regardless, um, yeah, BJ Roper Hubbard, see here, uh, he's been with us uh, in high A ball for a decade and done a good job there for us. Excellent at teaching, hitting, excellent at development, good with mechanics. Another guy who's got good relationships with the players, uh, the kind of cornerstone coaches that when we revamp this entire coaching staff um, right at the beginning of this playthrough in 2024, we brought these guys on board. They've been with us for a decade, uh, but we'd like to keep them around if possible. And so that's why we let a fair amount of uh, coaches leave us this off season. Uh, so we could potentially do some shuffling, do some promotions, keep the good coaches that we have in our organization happy by promoting them, and then hopefully fill in some of the lower levels of the organization with some young talent. And before we just go ahead and promote both Bush and Conway, uh, we will take a quick look at the pitching coaches who are available and typically the first thing I look at is their ability to teach pitching and you can see there are some legendary um, teachers out there. Um, the other things that I care about particularly with the pitching coaches are their ability to handle development and influence mechanics and if it's a guy who's going to be at the major league level uh, also care about their ability to handle aging although admittedly um, even at the major league level, I care about the teaching, the development and mechanics a bit more uh, because generally you're still going to have guys with some untapped potential at the major league level in most cases when they're first coming up. And uh, it's always nice to kind of be able to influence mechanics and discover some untapped ability that... Uh, nobody ever recognized in the pitcher before he got to that coach. And there obviously are some coaches to consider here who are on paper even better than the guys that we're considering promoting. Um, Ryan Reidenauer is a good example. Legendary at teaching pitching, outstanding development, outstanding in handling aging, good with mechanics. And he's a guy who... Um, we also think would have good relationships with our Oakland A's players. He also, with that personable personality, uh, would fit in well with the existing coaching staff that we have. So I think purely on paper, I could argue, you know, bring on a guy like Ryan Reidenauer, um, Pedro Strop from the Royals organization might even be a better profile, legendary teaching pitching, excellent with development and aging, legendary with mechanics. Um, Strop, that controlling personality, I think might be a little bit of an issue with our team and his relationships are only average. So probably not a direction that I would go, but there certainly are some guys that look better on paper but I think I am inclined to keep the guys who have been part of our organization together. So I think I'm still inclined to promote Dave Bush. Um, admittedly, you know, when we look at the ratings, he's not as high as some of those other potential options. But I do believe in loyalty. Um, I know this frustrates some of you, but um, I don't just play this game purely as a pure spreadsheet, purely optimizing every single decision, which uh, I know is frustrating to some of you, and I apologize for that. But my thought is um, if we take a look down here at the pitching coach spot that we have available in Class A right now, and we look at the guys who um, 
are potentially available there. You can see that some of these guys with very strong profiles, Lucas Knowles, legendary at teaching, pitching, excellent with development mechanics and aging, and only average relationships, which isn't perfect, but even guys like Lucas Knowles are still available for our A team. So my thought is that if we do end up promoting the likes of Bush and Conway up to the majors and AAA respectively, we'll have a pretty good opportunity set uh, at the AA level to consider um, given that we're not in a position where we have to promote our D spies quite yet. But honestly, he's another guy. Um, if we thought he had um, good or better relationships with Oakland, I could certainly argue moving RD up from the high A level um, all the way to the majors. But quite honestly, if there isn't a great option for us in double a although i think there will be we can promote spies up to that level and um kind of backfill some of the lower levels within our organization the other reason and um you know this is again a's baseball unfortunately uh, but the other reason for me not to necessarily go at the highest end of the open market with some of these potential pitchers who are available like Ridenauer. And Ridenauer is an extremely attractive pitching coach. I can't argue about that. But he's looking for $680,000 to be our pitching coach. So we can probably lock him up for about half a million. Um, depends whether there's any other teams making offers for Ridenauer. But if we promote internally, we did just sign Bush to a five-year extension during this past season at 180000 a year. So given the budgetary constraints that we face as the Oakland A's, saving 300000 ish a year on our pitching coach for the next five years is not an immaterial consideration either at least in my mind given that uh despite the fact that we got a little bump earlier today to 168 from 164 we still have the lowest budget in all of baseball so i haven't made the final decision quite yet uh but i do think that uh just in the interest of the storyline of us growing with these coaches we brought on board in 2024 and the ability to um, also save some money which is important when you've got the least money to spend in the entire game I think I am a little inclined to promote Bush and Conway up through the organization uh, hitting coach wise We talked about Roper Hubbard wanting a promotion. Might be time to move him up to that open spot that we opened up in Double A, and then backfill in the lower levels of the organization. But we want to ensure that we uh, continue to have good coaching, and we also want to ensure that our staff cohesion remains very strong, which it has, and that our teachers at the major league level are also excellent at what they're doing which is where we are right now and thinking about um you know team chemistry we're in a good spot there as well we've got an ecstatic clubhouse as far as team chemistry a lot more good relationships than bad relationships with our manager and a lot of uh really positive player classes in the clubhouse and no negative player classes so um want to try to keep those things moving in the same direction or perhaps even improving as we start uh, 
making some of the free agency and trade and arbitration decisions that we're going to be thinking about and talking about and most importantly acting upon in the coming weeks and months of this offseason. And with that, uh, we'll call it an episode. Again, I know this is a little different than what we've typically done. Um, This is a lot of the thought process that I typically do behind the scenes over the first couple of days of the offseason before I come back with a new episode and let you know, hey, I made this trade, I made this trade, I uh, declined this option, I exercised this option, we added these coaches, Uh, we put these guys on the trade block, Uh, We kind of shopped these guys and uh, didn't like what we could get. So hopefully that um, additional detail about our thought process and how we're kind of trying to tee up this offseason is interesting to all of you. Uh, I'm sure it's interesting to some of you. I think I'd be very ambitious to think that this was interesting to everybody, but uh, Now I probably will go offline for a couple of days of game time and uh, think deeply about uh, some of the decisions that uh, we've put on the table as well as uh, some other decisions that uh, I haven't even thought about right now and probably come back in our next episode having uh, hopefully done a few trades, cleaned up the 40-man roster a little bit, um... And maybe we'll even learn more about the uh, results of that big offer that we've made to Jackson Ferris uh, by the time we get into our next episode. Until then, thanks so much for watching and hope you have a great day.